Today we're going to be taking a look at the contract gem. The basic idea for this gem is it allows you to have uh, some additional validation in your application. So if we take a look at the actual contract gem GitHub page real quick, uh, I'm going to go over this just because the usage itself is pretty simple. You can take a look at the timestamps in the in the progress bar to skip ahead if you just want to see the chapter where we cover actually adding it. Um, but the basic idea is you add a little signature to your method signature and this decorator of sorts effectively tells the, the method what the expected input type is, so what your parameters are, and what the output is, so whatever your return value is. Uh, and the reason why this is helpful is you, of course, get that level of validation where you're effectively writing many unit tests that then live inside of your code base. Now, out of the box, I believe it throws an error, which of course isn't ideal, but there is a way to configure it to like throw or to like log to your your log file or just tell the user something went wrong. And of course, that's the way you want to handle it because you shouldn't have a, a unit test that causes a fail in your in your production code base. So anytime you have like an exception that just gets thrown where you just get like a error page, that's really not ideal behavior. You should be handling your errors better than that. So I do think logging it's better, um, but having this type of validation can be helpful in some cases. So we're just gonna take a look at how to do this real quick. Now, in terms of the actual usage, uh, I'm not sure if this gem or the dry validation gem are more frequently used, but I have seen the dry validation gem used in another project that I'm interested in talking about. So we're gonna be looking at the contract gem, but it is effectively a similar usage to the dry validation gem. I just feel like maybe the dry validation gem has like some more powerful uh, capabilities maybe but we're gonna be looking at this one first today just because I feel like it's a good intro to like how a contract works so the the basic way to do this is we're just gonna stop the server we're gonna run a bundle add and we're gonna add the contracts gem I believe I think it's contracts with a s yes and then we're just gonna add device we have something to work with all right now that that's done we're just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna full screen this real quick we're going to run a bundle, uh, not a bundle, we're going to run a rails g devise colon install command to install device real quick. And then we'll run a rails g devise user just so we have something basic to play around with. We can then go ahead and run a rails db colon migrate command. And then we'll run a rails g controller pages home command. So we have a basic home page. And then we'll run a uh, rails s, I guess. I don't know if we ran the DB migrate. My brain is, is totally fried, so I'm not thinking clearly. So we'll come over here, we'll refresh, we'll go to slash pages slash home. That seems to be working. Let's come into our routes real quick and just change, oops, let's just change our routes to be a root and this slash to a hash, just so we go here when we go to the, the root of the application. So just some basic setup is what we're doing right now. We can then come into our views, pages, and our home page. And in here, I'll hit control B to hide the side panel. Uh, you probably don't care, so I'm just going to paste this in and then I'll full screen it real quick. Feel free to pause the video. We're just going to do a quick check to see if the user signed in or if they're not signed in. Uh, and then for this, we're going to change this to actually just be the current user.email. You'll see about the username in a second here. So once we have this, we'll come in here and we'll click sign up. We'll just create a basic user account. For me, I'll say it's dean at example.com with a password of password. We'll click sign up. We'll get the device error because device is still broken and a complete mess. And then we'll just go ahead and we'll log in anyways because it does create the account. It just fails to, to log in. And if you want to fix that error, by the way, you can like either add the turbo stream as an accepted uh, redirect or you can go into your uh, device views and just add in the, the turbo false on your, your uh, links in your sign up page. OK, so now we have this. And what we can do is we can come into our user model. So we'll go into models user.rb. And inside of here, we can create a quick method. So we'll just say def username, and then we'll just do a uh, email split first, and that'll just return that. And then we can come over here and refresh the page after we change this to be the current user dot username again. We'll refresh the page, and now we get the the dean there. And if we want to do something extra, we can do like dot capitalize. So this is a quick little like demo username method I like to use, and I figured this would be a good way to just show you how to add in a contract. Now, of course, over time, you're gonna end up changing this uh, whenever you add in like an actual username method, if that's the way you wanna go. Uh, but for now, we can just use this as an example. So to use the contracts, as far as I'm aware, you could either do this in a higher level, like uh, place in your, in your project where it, it would be uh, included in like multiple classes or something, or you can just come up at the top and just do a require and then uh, contracts. 
So that'll give you your contracts. And then the next thing you want to do is down here uh, or up here, you want to include your contracts, contracts, colon, colon, core. And then you also want to include the contracts built in. So this should give you everything you need according to their readme page. And if I look at this page, we, uh, and I'll have links to all these links, uh, all these pages in the video description. But if we look at this page, we have a whole different, a whole bunch of different types of checks we can do, including like logical checks to see if something like say something might be there or it might be nil. So in the case of this username, we don't expect to get a string, but we might as an argument for some weird reason. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. So I'd highly recommend reading through this just to see what, what you can use. Um, but the way that this works is without needing to use the namespace here like they're doing, uh, what you can do is you can just come up top above like your username here, just say uh, contract and then say, um, we'll do like a string to a string. And if we do this, I don't think we'll get any errors. Seems good to me. But what we can what we can do instead to just test this is uh, if we look back at our types here and we come up to the top, we can see that num oops that num is a type. So let's just put in num, and now it's expecting this to return a number. So now if we refresh, you'll see that we get that error in our application. So of course this isn't what you would want. You would want something to uh, like log out if if you run into an error like this. So you'd want to do some error handling it's a really useful way to sort of figure out where the where the issue is. So let's say like we didn't have the user.rb open. We're just trying to like change this from email to username, right? So somewhere in our application, we do dot username. We then run the code and then we get an error. We can very quickly look at this and see that it expected a number for the return value. Uh, let me just zoom in a bit and close this. It expected a number, it got a string or return to string, it tells you where the value was guarded in. So you know this is in the user uh, model and in the username method, and it tells you which contract through the error. So you can very quickly just come into your us user model, search for username, and then immediately you, you, like, you're in the location where, where the bug happened. And then of course you can change this to a string and you won't run into that issue anymore. Uh, the other thing you can do is one of the checks in here, I think it's under logical, you can do the maybe check. And then you can just say, maybe you'll get a string and then you'll return a string. Now, of course, if this like, I don't know, takes in a, uh, a number for you to return, or I'll just put, I'll just name it something else. It, it takes in an apple and that's actually like your number of apples or something, right? So right now it's going to throw an error because it expected uh, one and it got zero. So we have to come into our homepage and instead of just passing in uh, like the string apple or just the string string which should cause this to pass. What we can instead do is we'll just pass in the number four and we should get a similar error where immediately it tells us, hey, our validation's messed up. So it, this isn't gonna work because it's guarded in the user and it expected a string or nil, but you passed in a number because I guess reading is hard for you. So that's another way that this can save you some time. Now, of course, a lot of this, and this is sort of where I have an issue with this, it is nice but in the same vein, this is essentially just doing an assertion in a unit test, right? So you do want to, and it says similar things if you like look up uh, like Ruby contracts and how they work, like this blog post here, which I'll uh, link to in the video description. It says something similar where it's like, you might find places where this is useful, uh, but you could also just feel like it's not useful. And it's up to your discretion and your team's discretion to decide if something like this is going to be beneficial for you. So like right here, it says in conclusion, contracts are not always the answer, but they can be really useful. And we prefer to maintain our original logic and handle specific cases with different logic. So that is one of the benefits. But of course, at the end of the day, all this is, is it's just like some type of or some form of uh, defensive coding, right? So if, if this is something that interests you, I would suggest looking into it. I would just also suggest that if you hadn't considered it, you can do something similar with like model validations, or you can do something similar with some unit tests that you just run, uh, because this is gonna have a small amount of overhead. Now I'm led to believe it's a, a minimal amount of overhead, but 
anytime you're requiring something, including two things, and then having some check run before the method is used every single time, you do have to assume that there's gonna be a non-zero overhead. Now it could be a negligible amount, but over time, negligible amounts can also add up to something. So if performance is a serious concern, you'd probably wanna benchmark like what the impact of something like this has. But yeah, hopefully this was helpful uh, and hopefully I'll see you in the next video.